While one side of deregulation is the rich person's playthings, the other side of deregulation is this, poo brown, faux Tuscan, cheap, minimal infill. What gets me here is the sense of lost opportunity. Whatever you see behind me could have been so much better. Individual architects looking carefully at how people might live, giving each house some sort of sense of individual style in the 21st century. But what we've got instead are gated communities and signs saying private road and no access, and every house fairly much interchangeable. Is that the way we want New Zealand to be? Not me. It seems there must be more potential in our domestic architecture for individuality, for something affordable, something attainable, something spatially interesting. I'm disappointed always in the way architects so quickly pick up style and spit it out without actually contributing much to it or, or developing it, you know? We've almost become so codified now that there's only one shape and form for a living space and that's a long rectangle with a, a kitchen parallel at one end and um, an empty space. You've only got to see the dreadful excesses that were committed in Auckland in the 80s in the, you know, the Chase Corporation era to know what happens when people forget that their architecture makes a frame that people have to live in for 50 or 60 years. You get a disaster. I mean, architects have really heavy responsibilities. Here's the office. What's left of it? 90s housing wasn't just an aesthetic disaster, it was a disaster that cost many of us hundreds of thousands of dollars. If anything showed us the importance of design, it was the leaky building crisis. Here, all the people who were supposed to look after the New Zealand house, be they builders, council officials, draftsmen or architects, let us down. In every way, the leaky building crisis represents to me the fact that the New Zealand house had completely lost its way. I think architects are a little bit lost at the moment and really don't have anything that they believe in. I don't think they've really got anywhere to go. You look at the works of um, some architects and they're really just channeling wallpaper magazine. We've just kind of got magazines and images of how other people live washing up on our shores and we're just doing that. And I think everyone in a way is really waiting for the next big idea. One of the great things about New Zealand is it's a nuggety little culture in which ideas bounce back into life when they're least expected. And in the first years of the 21st century, when it seems like architects have given up doing anything but channeling wallpaper magazine, the idea of a little wooden New Zealand house re-emerges in a forest of beech trees. Every now and again, you know, some smart person in New Zealand tries to invent a new industrialised housing system, don't they? You know, they come up with sort of boring regularity. Here's another way to solve the housing problem with a, a kind of a factory built system. And to me, the sister building system in New Zealand is a, is a machine piece of four by two. And it has wonderful freedom about it. You know, you can do so many things with it. In an age where a beach house can cost 20 million, this house cost $100,000. But as a house that says more than just economy, the message is not that a house can be cheap, the message is that a house can be well designed, watertight and resonant, all for less than the cost of a top end BMW. And for the first time in years, it's an architect designed house the ordinary Kiwi can afford. I mean, I think that's what you try to do with any architecture, isn't it? It's kind of like represent the past, the present, and give at least a wink to what a future might be, you know, all wrapped up in one, however small the wink is, you know, whether it, yeah, a use of materials or whatever. And once again we see the birth of a New Zealand house. Melling Morse architects designed this house for a father and son, and they're building it themselves with simple materials designed to their needs, it'll keep them warm and the adverse Wellington weather out. And this house too is built to a modest budget. It's an architect designed house you or I could afford and one that celebrates hundreds of years of architecture and design in New Zealand. 
For the Melling Morse houses are no isolated moment in our architectural history, they're part of our long conversation about the New Zealand house. When I walk down the path of this house, I'm immediately in love with it. Not even finished, but I can see all these references. You've got the wonderful Wellington hillside and its site where there's four levels one after the other, which reminds us of a whole series of innovative architects from John Craig through Roger Walker and Ian Athfield back to Bill Tumarth and before. So there's a whole history of culture brewing away in this house. But you don't have to know all that sort of stuff. You can just look at the materials. You can look at the corrugated iron and you can look at the hammer marks on the timber and you think, yeah, that's the way we build here. This is what we do. This is what Dad would do if he added a room. The other thing about this house is that it tells us how people want to live in 2005. And I kind of like the idea that in 20 years' time, someone else will come here and say, oh, isn't this all terribly out of date? And, you know, we don't like to live like that anymore. And someone will change it and alter it, who knows how. But the fact that we can do that to our little wooden houses in New Zealand is something rather wonderful. So you know that even in the 21st century, the whole idea of the New Zealand house is going to survive. The first time they saw this tiny forest in a suburb near Wellington, the architects loved it. Paradise. <laughs> just gorgeous, isn't it? Yep, yep. <laughs> Why? Oh, all those trees and the light through the trees, it's just beautiful. Imagine if you could build something that had that sort of light coming through trees. And they did. They built the Macrocarpa and Glass Samurai House for John Jarvis, a school teacher and retired martial arts instructor. The, the brief was quite simple, no plastic, no concrete, no paint. Jarvis has lived in Japan where there's a philosophy that you shouldn't be able to tell where the garden ends and the house begins. So the balcony that inside forms the upstairs continues right through the outside wall and juts into the treetops. The kind of things that he asked for were always sort of implied rather than kind of over-prescribed, you know. He's quite interesting sort of character, John. An architect's dream. Yeah. A restriction on the property was that no trees could be removed. Not that the owner wanted to anyway, and the designers raised the floor level to protect the tree roots. He's like an art critic. He's a man that loves nature and loves things, you know, but he's a school teacher. So he deserves something beautiful, you know? Beautiful and budget. It's something Melling and Morse have earned a reputation for. This house was built for around $100,000, a challenge they couldn't resist. No, you just accept the problem, don't we? We just take the problem and accept it and work from that. Yeah. You know, and, and if they had more money, the problem would have been different. Yeah, yeah, but there is <laughs> a bottom line. There is a bottom line whereby all you could do is pitch a tent. <laughs> The idea was to put a simple box among the trees. In architect speak, a non-competitive insertion into the forest. You know, humans can't compete with the beauty of trees. Although it's, it's quite small, it doesn't appear so. And it's just fun living in. And even though a neighbour keeps asking him when he's going to put the garden in, Jarvis is quite happy with his tree-hugging house-come-garden the way it is. Kim Hurring, 3 News.